introduction and thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to have a you know, for, for me an unusual audience, so I, I hope you will enjoy it. So, as Alexandra said, statistical physics, that's my field. So let me first explain this complexity. So what do we mean by complexity? We speak about complex systems such as you know the brain, the internet, cancer, or all possible other systems. The, but so, so, so one could say something like complexity characterizes something with many parts that interact with each other and something emerges from that behavior. The bottom line is that scientists don't really agree what's a complex system, what's a complexity, we could argue about that. So in this talk, I, you know, there's at least one field where for several decades already people agree on what's complexity, and that's computer science, when they talk about computational complexity. So in a large part of this talk, I will talk about computational complexity. It's a well-defined notion that is at the bottom line of basically of many fields. When you do some modeling or data, data processing, you need to think about computational complexity of what you are doing. So what is computational complexity? So first of all, what's a, what's a problem? Computational problem is to think about any problem that can be solved by a computer. So you know, if you ask a computer, uh, find me a cure for cancer, so that's not a problem that nowadays can be solved by a computer. But if you ask a computer here, I give an example, a graph coloring problem. So you, 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 draw, you, you make some points, and some of the points you connect them with lines, and then you tell the computer I have three colors, and can you please for me color the points, each point with one color, such that if the two points are connected, they don't have the same color. Right? So imagine the map of Europe, you want to color the countries in different colors, but you don't want the neighbors to have the same color, you want to be able to distinguish the countries, so that's the kind of application for this problem. So that's, that's a problem that can be solved by a computer today. Okay? So, and then computational complexity is simply the number of time steps or the size of the memory that is needed in the computer to solve that problem. And we always think about it as the size of the input. So in this case, it's the size of this graph, the number of points and the number of edges. Okay? So an example for this graph coloring, here I gave you the color. So now, how did I find it? So you can think a bit about some smart ways, but if you don't want to be smart, you just say, well, you gave me three colors, so every point can have you know, any of them, so I just might try all the possibilities. How many possibilities do you have here? If you have n points, then you have three to the power n possibilities. So fine, computer can solve this. So you can try all the possibilities and you check if neighbors have the same colors or not. If, they, if, if you find a possibility where they don't, then you are happy. If for all of them, you always find a edge where the ending points have the same color, then you say this problem doesn't have a solution and that's an acceptable solution, it's a proof that there is no solution. So computers can solve, it, can solve this problem. So we can go home. No? Well, the problem is that uh, the, the, the size of the system here is in the exponent. So here, just to explain you how bad an exponential is, <coughs> it's a picture that I just got from, uh, from my favorite back, uh, website. So here on the y-axis you have meters, and here you have meters, okay? And now this little man, so that will be me, is walking in this direction, one meter per second. And the y-axis is going up exponentially. So, okay, one meter per second, you can walk in, okay, walking, okay, walking. Okay. And by now, I'm passing the moon with about the speed of light. So that's how fast exponential grows. Can you hear you, that's just the second part of the cartoon. So exponentially is not acceptable. It's too long, too much memory. That's not interesting. So, so in computer science, we distinguish between hard problems that you supposedly are exponentially, exponential and problems that we can solve in time that is a linear in the size of the input. That's what we really want. So, so there is a whole field about, about distinguishing if a problem is hard or easy, exponential or polynomial or linear. So here is an example of you know, what, what is, so here is the first example of what is a hard problem. Finding the needle in the haystack, it says something like it took you 65 seconds, 65,298 seconds. So that's, that's a hard problem. But now, that's 
that's not a problem that is easily solved by a computer either. So to formalize all this, the, so this is maybe one of the most, it's probably the most formal slide. Here I want to explain you what the Boolean satisfiability problem, because that's, you know, that's the basic problem that computer scientists think about when they like to think about computational complexity. So, so this is how a formula of such a problem looks like. So you have these variables, x1, which appears here and here, x2, which is here and here, x3. So these are Boolean variables. So they take two possible values, either true or false. Okay? These little signs, these are negations. So if I need to be true, I get false. Then, you know, so this is just a logical formula. In the brackets, these signs are logical or. So each of these three brackets is saying either x1 must be false, or x2 must be true, or x3 must be false. So that's the first constraint on these variables. The s and this, this sign is and. So at the same time, we want that either x1 is true, or x3 is true, or x4 is false, etc. So this is a Boolean satisfiability problem. And you know, it's pretty, you, know, you can encode a lot of problems in this language. And what's amazing, so now you know, I was asked if, if it is retrospective, I should go 20 years back. But here I'm already going 50 something, four years back. So that's a bit too much, but I will come, I will come up pretty fast. So in 71, computer science basically established a way of thinking about what are hard problems by the work of Stephen Cook, who proved that this problem is to be so-called NP-complete. What that means is that if this problem can be solved in polynomial time, then a large and very important class of problems can also be solved in, it, uh, in polynomial time. So in some sense, this one is the hardest of them all. So this is in 71. So, you know, and since then, it's basically one of the most outs outstanding theoretical questions in science is if these NP-complete problems can be solved in polynomial time or not. It's not known. And, you know, and since almost 50 years, people don't. So it's widely believed that not, that there truly are hard problems. But is this so, you know, there's a whole field about this. But is this what it really, you know, matters in computational complexity? Because here I asked, does there exist an instance of this problem that cannot be solved in polynomial time? So even, you know, so, so this is a hard instance of this problem. But, but this one is not so hard. <laughs> And you would surely like to understand your practical application if you are here or here, because you definitely don't want to end up like them. <laughs> so, so, so one way of looking, you know, we, we should a little bit go away from this worst possible instance, but think rather about a typical instance. So are you know typical instances that we encounter in a, you know of problems that can be encoded as dissatisfiability are those or can be solved. Can we do something about that? So here is another bit of history in this in this field. So this is the one that I already told you. And then just well, a few years, some years after, there is a scientist Goldberg who showed this this interesting thing that if you create the formula in such a way that so you that that a variable is in, okay is included in a subclass with fixed probability, that means. That means you take these, these uh, brackets, these are your clauses, and for every variable you fix a probability, and you randomly, dis with that probability, you put it in that clause or not. And this way you create many clauses. Okay? And he proved that if you create this, uh, the problem in this random way, then almost all these instances will be easy to solve. So, okay, that's a, that's an interesting paper, it's an interesting result. And, but thanks to this, computer scientists actually believed that, that and, you know, even these hardest problems, like case satisfiability, <laughs> Boolean satisfiability, might in fact be on average easy. So the instances that you encounter are all easy. So you know, our life is not so bothered with this, with this exponential. So that was for you know, 12, 12, 12 years, when people thought that you know, there is this weird theoretical possibility of having hard instances, but 
But since basically all instances, you know, here we created them at random are easy, so maybe we don't have to be so bothered by that. After this paper, which with a, with a nice name, where the really hard problems are, in 91, in where they said, you know, this, here they even start, it is well known that for many empty complete problems such as case, typical cases are easy to solve. So that computationally hard cases must be rare. This paper shows that empty-complete problems can be summarized by at least one order parameter, and that the hard problems occur at critical value of such a parameter. So that created some, some bugs. You know, so what, what do they mean? So they define this random case of this fabulousy problem in a little bit different way. But, so like this, so you take n variables, so in our case it was four. You take m clauses, so these brackets, so in our case it was three. And now you imagine that both M and N are really large, not 4 and 3, but in our example it's 4 and 3. Then you put there the negations with probability 1 half, so you just flip a coin every time. And you introduce a parameter that is the ratio between the number of clauses. And here, for instance, you fix the length of, every of these brackets to 3. And you introduce a parameter which is the number of these constraints divided by the number of variables. So you have these Boolean variables, and every of these brackets is adding a constraint. So the bigger is this alpha, the harder it will be to satisfy this formula. The smaller it is, the easier it will be to find a solution. And what they showed in that paper is this picture. So first, so first on, the, on this axis is this parameter <coughs> alpha. So how many, what's the density of the constraints? How constrained is my problem? And here is the probability that a assignment of the variables that is satisfying the formula exists. And I have three different full lines here, which are for three different sizes of system. So, so, and you see that there is a big, there is a sh very sharp drop from one to zero, from probability one, like basically every formula is satisfiable, to zero, basically not no formula is satisfiable. And as the size is growing, this gets sharper and sharper. So in statistical physics, this reminds us of phase transition. If we study some you know, magnetic systems and plot the magnetization as a function of temperature, at the Curie temperature, we will have drops like that, and this makes it okay. But okay, I'm not mixing the statistical physics in yet. So let's, let's look at the dashed lines. So that would be time to decide <laughs> if the problem was satisfiable or not by some you know, very basic algorithm available, available at the time. And you see that that the time is really growing around this threshold. So that's what they mean. This is the other parameter, and the hard instances are around this threshold. So this now you know we knew how to generate them, and this is this started to be very intriguing. So now where is the statistical physics? So I already, you know, th th there was no statistical physics so far, right? Statistical physics, you mentioned some some spins and magnets and some some you know, crystals and gases and liquids and colloids and things like that. This is what we study in statistical physics. Not like Boolean variables and computational problems and coloring of maps or something. So, okay. So in the meantime, what, were, what was happening in statistical physics? So there was a little subfield of statistical physics, physics studying something that is called a spin glass. So a spin glass is a material so, it's a, so, so a typical sample of a spin glass is a chunk of gold with a little bit of iron impurities. And people say you really have to be a physicist to be interested in the impurities and not in the gold. <laughs> but that's the impurities that, are, that have really interesting magnetic properties. And, and, and people like to understand how, you know, how does the magnetism of this material behave. So it's not really a material that would be used for something amazing, you know, to make a new, I don't know, LCD screen or a new material that goes on a spacecraft to the space. It's pretty useless. No, there is nothing known about practical use of this material. But theoretically, it's really interesting material. And to understand the theory of spin glasses, there is, there is a really amazing story behind it from <coughs> the point of view of science, because in 75, there was this paper that presented a computation that was describing the properties of this model that looked correct. There was no formal error in the computation. But this computation was predicting something that was not possible. It was clearly not possible. It had ne negative entropy for some problem that clearly cannot have negative entropy. 
there was something wrong with the computation, but it was anyhow published because nobody saw, you know, it was just a few pages paper, nobody saw what is there wrong. And then five, you know, people were really puzzled by that. And five, five years after, there is a physicist, Parisi, that came with a solution of what was wrong in that book, uh, computation. That was, uh, that was, uh, that was just crazy. You know, it didn't make any sense that that would be a solution, and many people didn't believe it. And it took 20 years actually to understand it and to prove mathematically that his solution was indeed right, and that that's actually what's happening. So there was this, there was this piece of work happening in spin glasses and a lot of effort that 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 was made to understand this solution and what is happening, and everything was, you know, not connected really to applications because this material is not really useful. But it resulted in a, in a set of methods, and here are just some buzzwords about what are the names of these methods, cognitive method, replica method, message puzzle, to describe these problems and to understand their behavior. Okay, so that was in the meantime. And then, in 1997, two physicists in Paris at that time actually realized that the random case is a kind of spin glass. So they, you know, they talk to people they, about what they are studying, these spin glasses, and somebody told them, look, I, I heard about this computational problem, random case, and it just looks like your problem, you know, if you like call this variable like that and call that clause your interaction, and it, it's the same problem. And so they started to work on the random case. And with a little refinement of the methods, which was due to <coughs> Parisi to, in, in 2001, so then Meza Parisi and Zekina in just 2002, so this happened quite fast, created a, you know, I, I was looking for a word, an eruption in the studies of the random case. You know, the people that were interested in the complexity, computation complexity, in how, where are the hard instances of this random Boolean satisfiability, suddenly, you know, they had papers from physics that were using methods that they totally didn't understand, of course, because the physicists took 40 years to understand them. So how did you know the mathematicians suddenly understand this day's time? They're not trivial things. And now these physicists were telling them things like, hey guys, we can compute this threshold, which in mathematics last year there was a paper where actually they proved their results partially. But at that time they had no idea how to compute something like that. They also predicted a reason, and that will be the next slide, why the hard instances are close to the threshold. And not only that, but they also invented an algorithm that was able to solve the, this, this instances of random case satisfiability in a region where you know, no computer scientist was able to solve them in, you know, in the same short time as them. And this algorithm, so, so that was really what made the difference why the computer scientists believed them. Because they had a paper with some conjecture and methods they didn't understand. But with that came an implementation that was working on their instances on which none other algorithm they had before was working. So that really made them interested. And it's really remarkable that this, for, in, for some instances, this is still the best algorithm nowadays, so 12 years after. And here, you know, the timescales in physics are decades, but the time scales in computer science are, uh, or in machine learning, artificial intelligence, are much shorter. When you go to a conference and you go to the same conference two years after and the main, the, the main things people talk about is not at all the same things. Everything is moving faster, much faster. So something that stays the best even 12 years after, that's, that's a lot. So, you know, so, so, so how come, what, what, what piece of physics was really happening in this case of this stability problem? So as you are changing this parameter alpha, that was the number of constraints divided by the number of variables, you are actually, you are actually moving in a space as, so, so that was the result of Sekina, Paris and Mesar, as if you were in a material that is glassy and you were lowering the temperature. So a glass at high temperature is a liquid and in the satisfiability problem this interprets like Okay, in the liquid, every uh, dynamics equilibrates easily, so <coughs> every algorithm can solve the satisfiability problem. And then when you cool down the glass, the glass becomes solid, so the atoms are not moving anymore uh, much, they're just a bit fluctuating, but they're not moving around as in the liquid. 
But it's not a crystal. If you do some spectroscopy on it, you don't have any peaks. It's disordered. It's, it's not a crystal at all. So it's disordered, yet it's solid. And in terms of energy landscape, you know, what's the energy as a function of positions of all the possible molecules? This means that there are you know, many... So in terms of energy landscape, that's where the similarity is in the, in the, in the case satisfiability problem. When you look at the energy, at the number of unsatisfied clauses would be your energy in that case. If you look at that landscape, it's you know, not only vaguely, but it's formally really the same as, as in the glass. And they could compute this you know, phase transition be between the liquid and the glass, because that's what people are doing in physics. And these phase transitions actually did correspond to some barriers where known algorithms were known to not work anymore beyond that point. So, so there was this connection between phase transitions coming from some analogy in materials in physics and algorithmic barriers in, in, in that problem. So, you know, in, in past decades, so this was somehow the beginning, but then when people understood this, they, they, they worked in several directions, so refining this picture, mathematicians got interested into proving that what the physicists are computing is really happening, and, you know, there would be a big list of works here, I mentioned only this one where they proved this threshold, which is, you know, that's, that's one of the big open problems that was there, and, and last year, in December or November or so, it's not an open problem anymore. And mo most importantly, probably, is that they, they applied these methods developed in spin glasses to other problems, not only, you know, boolean satisfiability, but problem, but um, systems like the error correcting codes, when, you when your cell phone is receiving signal, there's a lot of noise in the signal, so it must, it must correct the error such that you understand what the person on the phone is telling you, studies neural networks and spark estimation, you know, matrix factorization, you know, some problems in machine learning, artificial intelligence all over the place. And one example I want to give you is in this compressed sensor. Because that's a, that's a really nice example. I should look how much time I have. You tell me. Where are they? That's OK. That's OK. So compressed sensor. So <coughs> these are people I've worked on for the compressed sensing. So compressed sensing, what is it? It's, you know, so, so, you know, can take a big breath or ask questions, or it's different topic. So what is compressed sensing? So you go to holidays and you take a lot of pictures. Not everybody likes to take pictures. And then your camera is taking the pictures pixel by pixel. You bought the camera such that it has a lot of pixels, right? That was what the, what the seller in FNAC told you. This has, I don't know how many millions, this one. So that's why you bought that camera. But then you take the pictures, you store them in your computer, and you compress them. And when you compress them, they take much less bits than the number of pixels you had. And you're happy about it because otherwise you would have to buy not only a you know, better camera, but also a better computer. You know? <laughs> so, so we use compression every time, every day. Now, the, so why can you compress the picture? Because in some bases, it's sparse, actually. That's, you know, if I take a picture of a wall, I really need only to draw the boundary, right? That's, that's much less information than every single pixel of the wall. That's the idea. So for pictures, that's, you know, the whole field of image processing is studying, like, what linear transformations to make <coughs> with the picture, such that after the linear transformation, you have only few coefficients that are non-zero, the others are basically zero, and if you forget the others and you inverse this transformation, you reconstruct your picture and you don't see that you, know, you, you, you didn't lose anything. You have the same resolution, the same nice pictures, you are very happy about that. So this is the principle of compression. And the idea of compressed sensing is why would we take the full picture in the first place? Cannot we compress it already at the level of measurement? And now, why would that be interesting? Well, for the camera, it's not so interesting because, after all, you know, you have your camera, then you compress it in your computer. No big deal. But imagine, for instance, the <coughs> nuclear magnetic resonance, where hopefully you don't have to go. But if one day you have to go, then you have to spend, you know, 30 minutes in that machine, and it's not comfortable, and it 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 costs a lot of money, and and you get the, the dose of the radiation, and it's you know, if if instead of 30 minutes you could spend there only three, it would be great. 
So in cases where the measurement time, you know, imagine that measuring every pixel takes you some time, and if you measure only, you know, you compress <laughs> something to 10%, and if at the same time you were able to measure it in 10% of the time, this would be great. In, ima in, um, in medical imagery, it would also be great. I don't know, satellites, you, you put the satellite out, it has a very, very limited resource of power, because otherwise it would be too heavy and it wouldn't fly so far. So you don't want to measure everything. If you can measure only 10% and send it to Earth and then on Earth computationally you inverse, you know, that's, that's another situation where this kind of thing would be interesting and a range of other situations. So, so measuring the signal in a compressed way in the first place, never going through the phase where you just measure pixel by pixel. So that's the idea of compressed sensing. And okay, here I just listed some 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 applications that people think about. But let me now set a little to this probably the second form of the slide. So let me set this problem mathematically. So these transformations in which images are sparse and everything everything is, is linear. So you can think about those as you know these transformations, the measurements are matrices, the pixels that's just vectors. So your data are vectors. The measurement can be represented by a matrix, and what you measure is multiplication of that matrix by that vector. Okay? Now I told you signals of interest are sparse. So the idea is here, you know, this is the size of your signal, it's sparse, and you won't want to multiply it by a matrix that is rectangular like that because you want the number of measurements to be much smaller than the size of the signal. That's the idea. So if you have a linear system like that, I mean you will have a lot of, you know, this is what you know, the, these measurements you know, <coughs> this matrix you know because you know your machine, and you want to reconstruct back the x. So if ever m was equal to n, you can invert that matrix and you're fine. But in a case where m is much smaller than n, such a linear system has many solutions. Which one should, even if you find them all, which one should you choose? So I told you which one should you choose, the one that has most zeros. But that's again hard because you would have to find all exponentially many of them and choose the one that has m most zeros. So you see, this is again one of these NP-complete problems. Like if, you, if you think just a little bit, you come only with a exponentially costly solution. So this is not good. You must, you must bring some better solution. So the paper that established all this direction of research in co-processing is only in 2006. So now we moved. We moved up. Okay, now we are only... Eight, I'm still used to 2014, nine years ago. And already today, this 11, well, but okay, wait. Because I, this I forgot, because every time I give this talk, I update this number, and today I didn't update it. So this number is already from maybe like uh, November or something like that when I talked about compressing last time. So, so it's all, it has many citations. Okay, this is the bottom line. It's, it's, a, it's a very active field of research. So what is this phase diagram about? This paper established, you know, you can do this compressing in a computationally efficient way. So what is this? This is the number, this is the sparsity of your system. The number of non-zero divided by the total dimension of your signal. <laughs> so when you're close to zero, it's very sparse. And when you're close to one, well, it's not sparse at all. You know, if you measure a random noise and you really want every pixel right, then you have to, you know, you have to measure every pixel and there, there is no chance to compress or to, to compress sensor. And this is how much measurements you save. So if it is one, it means you didn't save any measurement. But these numbers mean like what percentage of measurements were you doing. So if I have 0.2, it means you know I was five times faster than in the traditional way. And what this paper showed is that, so obviously if you want to measure something where you have certain number of non-zeros, you at least have to get as many measurements to match the number of non-zeros. Because the zeros, that's fine, you don't need any information about them because you know those are zeros, but you need the information about the non-zeros. So this blue line, like, well, you cannot possibly make it work below the blue line. Okay? The green line, that's the traditional way of measuring. And this paper showed that above the red line, you can make compressed sensing work efficiently. 
So that's already interesting. If you have, if you can compress on ten percent, you can measure with thirty percent. That's good. You know, factor three in an NMR, like that would be amazing, amazing. But you, you know, in principle, you can do better. But we didn't know how computationally efficiently. So until you know, we realized that compressed sensing is also a spin glass problem. So we can apply our <laughs> statistical physics method and revise this picture, this phase diagram. And as a first result already we obtained is that the, this, this <coughs> is new line. So, oh, I changed the color. I, okay. Another thing I should be more careful about. So this was blue line. So this is below. So I will talk about Below the red line, you cannot possibly do compressions. Above the green line, that was this don't know how paper, you know, things are known, that's why, this, that's why this paper got so famous. With this spin glass analysis, you actually can find an algorithm that works up to this blue line for some classes of signals. So that's already really good. You are already getting, you know, some gain over what was possible what was possible before. So that's nice. And not only this, but you can also, you know, whereas this green line, it came from some calculation, it didn't have any insightful interpretation, you know, it's just that the algorithm doesn't work there, but there was no insightful reason behind it. But when you think where this blue line comes from, you realize it's a, what we call, spinodal of a first order phase transition. So now, to make you understand, okay, we're... Right, so we don't really need that. So to make you understand what's a first order phase transition and what's, what's you know, that, that the algorithm don't work in this regime because they are stuck in a metastable state in the same sense as, you know, real materials can be stuck in the metastable state. So the most famous example probably is a diamond. Did you know that diamond is a metastable state, that the equilibrium state of diamond is the uninteresting carbon, you know? For those that were married or engaged recently, or would be happy about that. But unfortunately, diamond is pretty stable. You know, it stays diamond for a long time. The same way as this, um, as this liquid here in these uh, hand warmers. So either if you have small babies that have colic, that's useful, or to mountains. Okay. So what is what are these? Okay, there is a liquid here in these things. So I will, I will send you these two. So here we have one. You have one. So please do the same thing as me. So you know, it's my experiment. <laughs> so you see there is a coin inside, right? Yes. So press this coin. Press it. And you will see that there is something growing. And it's here is liquid, here it's solid. Oh my god. Here is solid. And it's getting warm. Not too warm, you know. Don't worry, you will not burn yourself. It's comfortably warm. And it grows up to the end of this of this system. And now that it's warmed and solid, you can pass it around. So what happened here <laughs> is that this was super cooled liquid. And when I pressed the coin, I created a little nucleus of crystal by the you know impurity by pressing the pressing the coin. And as soon as the liquid realized that there is a little piece of crystal, it actually started to grow because it was energetically favorable for it to grow. So in physics, we can escape metastable states, that was the liquid, by nucleation. Nucleation is this growth. So why in this, you know, in this compressed sensing, here the algorithm is stuck in a, in a metastable state, and we don't know what to do in the computer. So how is that problem different from this one? Well, this one is in three dimensions. The nucleation only works because the interactions between the molecules are organized in three or you know, some finite Euclidean dimension. When you think about this compressed sensing problem, it would, you know, if, I, if I was to embed it into some dimensional system such that you know, variables that somehow depend on each other would be close to each other in that space, I would have to have infinitely dimensional space. So in such a space, nucleation doesn't exist. In such a space, nucleation takes exponentially long time, not useful. But if I was, you know, if in the compressed sensing I had the freedom, 
if I go back, I had the freedom to design this matrix, this measurement matrix, because that's my machine. And you know, I'm the engineer, I'm, I can make the machine. So I can design this matrix F. So if I can design this matrix F in such a way that it corresponds, that it's doing the same job, but at the same time, it looks like if it is in finite dimensional space, and how do I do it? I show it to you. you know, so can the <coughs> insight that we gain from this analysis get us farther? So here is the warmer. And here is how I need to create this matrix in order to make it think that it's in one dimensional space. Before I was just taking it random. Every element was random. And that had the right mathematical properties to keep the information that is there in the signal, etc. So now I take it still random, but only block by block. A lot of blocks are zero, and these blocks that you know make it or you know I make a chain in a sense, and that that's that's what creates the good. That's what creates the one-dimensional in this case structure. And if I do it this way, and then the first block is a bit larger, that's what making it a bit easier. That's that's the role of this seed when I press the coin. Then the very same algorithm I was using before, but just with a differently designed matrix, and in some <coughs> machines this can be done, then the algorithm is doing well down to this information theoretical barrier. I, I cannot go below the red line, even with exponentially long algorithm. So thanks to this analysis from spin glasses that you know took 40 years to physicists, and for a long time it looked like it took for nothing. So thanks to this analysis, we actually can understand where this computational barrier comes from and overcome it. And, and we have an algorithm that now, you know, in idealized conditions, works down to here. So we can improve the performance of compressed sensing even farther. So that's one of these nice stories where the, you know, where the studies of complexity and statistical physics meet and lead to something interesting. So, oh, you, this is really bad to see. But this is just an example. Some of the pictures that people usually use to to uh, to give examples about me in image processing how well you can do. But it's really bad to see. But this is just to say that with our methods, oh, it does not. Work. That with our methods, you know, you can measure with you know this alpha zero point two here means that that you really do only 20% of measurements and it's still working fine. Whereas with the vanilla compressing method, you, would, you could measure 50% and it would be doing fine, but then it wouldn't be doing fine anymore. So, but that's, that's all. So, so that was the example, thank you. So now, you know, what's the, what's the future of this complexity? So now this is the hard part. So what can I say about this? So computational, so we learned that computationally hard problems are there, but by, our un by understanding where and by understanding why are they hard more fundamentally, we, we are getting really good at avoiding them and you're finding ways how to solve them efficiently anyway. And maybe this and a lot of other things are at the bottom of the fact that that as a consequence nowadays, in my point of view, we are really, you know, in a revolution of what artificial intelligence can do because, because things that are normal for us today, like smartphones and video calls and personalized search on Google and recommendation systems on Netflix and I don't know what, these are things that, you know, 10 years ago, people in machine learning would think, oh, we still need like 40 years to get there. And, but nowadays we are getting really, really good at it and you know it, it, it then I gave some examples like of, of things that we are just about to be able to do like you know making your smartphone screen <laughs> computationally check the picture such that when you get cold and you would have to read like that you don't have to do it and you don't need glasses it will be done computationally for instance or you know gadgets like like I know these smart things here that measure all possible things about your body and then you and you eat something, you put it in, and then you know it tells you, and then it will do the machine learning from the whole population, and it just tells you how to optimize your lifestyle, not to get ill, etc. <laughs> and then you know maybe one day you get 
by somebody on this, but then the doctor will be able to use that data to actually design a cure exactly for you, which takes into account many things, and and then then you just get to sci-fi. So, so 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 and there's the thing nowadays. That, you know, we know that computationally hard problems are probably there, but from where we stand today, the limits of what machines can do, they just are nowhere in sight. It seems like we can really do a lot of things by studying these problems, understanding them better and developing better and better and more efficient algorithms to solve things that before just, you know, okay, oof, we, would have the, we would need the time of the universe to solve them. So maybe not. So, okay, that's, that's it. Well, I finish here. <laughs> So, 
So the problems come from there. Now, my background is really physics. But uh, I start, in my, in my master's, I study these spin glasses. And what really you know, appealed to me, okay, maybe one of the bonuses, okay. <laughs> bonuses. this one, yes. is the statistical, this is, this is you know, in my current research, this is my cookbook. So I'm a physicist, but I realized that you know, I studied and I know very well some methods that can be applied to many other problems. So my cookbook is to talk to people and go to conferences and pick an important problem where I have a good idea that these methods can be applied. And then I just sit with that problem for several months and I do my little computations of the phase diagrams and the phase transitions in some pretty random artificial setting that is not relevant to anybody, you know, if I, if I submit a paper about it, they tell me, oh, but you assume so many things, no real problem has all these assumptions satisfied. And I say, no, don't worry, I do my computations. And then when I understand these things well, you know, maybe from the connections of the other problems that I solved in this way, I see something that people in that particular problem didn't see before. And that was, for instance, in this compress sensing, this trick with the design of the matrix that induces the, the nucleation that improves the algorithms even further. Or, you know, I have a couple of, couple of examples like that in my works where, where really this, this study, this theoretical study of the problem suddenly gives you an idea how to improve an algorithm. And that's the, you know, and so, so what's the output? Well, at one hand is the conjecture, you know, these studies are conjectures for mathematicians, so they like to prove that what we describe is actually there. And when you get some algorithmic idea, well, that's, that's interesting for the practitioners, right? And they test it on their real instances and put it in their toolboxes and on some problems it does better and they're happy, so that's the, that's the goal. So that's the good book part. That answers the question. All right. I was wondering, uh, as a scientist, how much do you think about uh, the possible applications uh, of these technology? Uh, and uh, what is your control uh, on the applications that could be done? It's more like an ethical question. I, I'd like yes. to know personally if you think about it or if, you, uh, if it's a yeah. problem for you sometimes when you're uh, doing your research. Or so I think about them a lot. Now the thing <coughs> is that... The thing is that... I have this impression that if I start to think too much about one application, that I really need to do that. And I don't have time to do this, you know, explorative part of the basic research, like look for the problems where this can be applied, etc. Because, okay, well, there's only 100% of, of their time. And, okay, I'm, Currently, I would say, you know, when, when, you, when you publish a paper in the right journal and go to present it to the right conferences, if it is a good idea, people will pick up on it. Then if, you know, if you think, oh, this is an application and you really want to be the one that, that develops that application, then I, know, I would more think about, you know, I create a startup and go away from research for a while to do it. But then it depends if you want to do that or not. Then it means you are not in research anymore and you are flooded by you know, all kinds of other problems. So there is still a long way from you know, basic research like that to actual applications. So this long way meaning a chain of you know, researchers pick an algorithm, test it on more relevant problems, but still synthetic ones, and then they see that, they, oh, it was tested, and then some engineer can eventually pick it, so it's, a, it's also a large time scale. So I do think about applications, but uh, every, you know, every serious thinking about applications is a lot of investment in terms of time. So 